Hello, I'm sure most of you, like me, are residents of this planet we call Earth, and as such are affected by its climate, especially here in Houston, where your air conditioner might as well be an honorary family member, and your heater is necessary for like two or three weeks in February. And every year, the summers are getting a little bit hotter, and the winters are also getting a little bit hotter. We're seeing the effects of climate change right here in our own community, albeit sometimes it may be very subtle, like a few degrees on your summer pool party. But sometimes, it's mid-February, the power has been out for days, temperatures are below freezing, you're bundled up in five blankets, eating dry cereal and savoring the last percent of your phone battery, wondering where did it all go wrong. Personal anecdotes aside, climate change is a very important issue. Sea levels are rising, currents are changing, animals are being pushed out of their habitat, and many are threatened with extinction. Storms that are supposed to happen every 500 years are becoming annual experiences. Climate change is a problem that will eventually affect every single person and thing on this planet if something isn't done about it. Today, I'm here to discuss a brief history of climate change, as well as the human impact on it through emissions and education, to hopefully involve some breaking edge solutions into our discussion. Now, civilizations as far back as ancient Greece were able to deduce that cutting down trees would change rainfall and temperatures in an area. And NASA says that humans have been causing emissions for some time now, which is why it's so strange that this man was the first one to theorize that humans could possibly have an impact on our climate. He is Savante Artemis, a Swedish scientist who first published this idea in an 1888 research paper and a follow-up paper in 1898 about how carbon could impact the environment. He theorized that when humans burn coal and natural gases, they release carbon, which can contribute to rising temperatures. Now, this was a great opportunity for humans to catch this problem early and examine some solutions before irreparable damage happened. Unfortunately for humans everywhere, people don't really enjoy to be blamed for things. So his findings were swept under the rug by the scientific community until much later. In the 1950s, extra funding from the Cold War allowed scientists to further look into problems they saw with warming in the North Atlantic regions. And in the 1960s, scientists finally had solid empirical evidence that could prove that human emissions could cause climate change. Now, even though scientists knew about this, it wasn't until environmentalist movements in the 1970s where the public became generally aware of the idea. And international action wasn't taken until the late 90s and early 2000s when the UN put together the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Still, there's a lot of education to be done. In fact, a study by the Royal Swedish Association of Scientists found that of the high school students surveyed, only 79% believed that climate change was caused by humans, and only 68% believed that it was an actual threat. This is because they weren't educated on the topic. In fact, after they took these opinions, they administered a test about the science behind climate change, and they found that those who held the belief that it was caused by human and that it was a threat typically did much, higher, uh, much better on the test than did those who didn't believe those things. This shows a correlation between being educated and being able to make ac accurate judgments about information. Now, the solution to this problem is simple. Educate people. Educate kids from a young age, make it a part of schools, teach them about it from a very young age, and once people become educated on the general idea, we can delve deeper, explore the specifics, and hopefully come up with some nice solutions to this, break, this global problem. Even once people have a basic education, there are still some issues. People who agree that climate change is a threat caused by humans still disagree on the extent to which humans cause it. I'm sure you've all seen the PSAs about single-use plastic or don't waste the electricity. And while yes, these are ways to reduce your personal carbon footprint, even with, if everyone was super vigilant about this, we still would only make a small dent in the huge problem that is human-caused climate change. The, the problem is, people don't know where to look for the solutions, so they target the areas in which the effects are most clearly seen, that being underprivileged, impoverished areas. For example, during Hurricane Katrina, lower-class impoverished neighborhoods were hit harder, while upper-class suburbs remained mostly intact. Similar things have happened in other hurricanes, like Hurricane Harvey and other 500-year storms that are becoming more and more common as our climate changes. These individuals and communities are getting the brunt of climate caused to catastrophe and are thus being targeted when we talk about climate change prevention policies, when in fact, the issues run much deeper than that. 
In a study by the Carbon Majors Database, they discovered that 71% of all human carbon emissions are caused by just 100 companies. Factories, industries, power plants, these make up for a majority of our emissions, yet only a minority of our ten attention when we're talking about ways to prevent climate change. Now, we may already be seeing some upward trends. Scientists estimate that by 2050, companies could face $300 billion of climate-caused damages, and companies are realizing this. They've begun to shift their policies to hopefully make this a better. But what if this doesn't come soon enough? Well, scientists have come up with a way to hopefully take carbon out of the atmosphere. Carbon capture is a really effective way to reduce carbon emissions at some of our choke points, like power points and factories. There's two ways to do this, pre-combustion and post-combustion. You can take the carbon out before or after the reaction happens. In post-combustion, amine filters are put over smokestacks and emission areas in factories to filter out carbon dioxide from reaching it to our air. And in pre-combustion, the gas before it's burned is put through a reaction to remove the carbon dioxide so it never enters the reaction in the first place. Now, this is all useful information, but what, what are we going to do if we can't capture that carbon we remove from the reaction? This is an important part if we want to curve these emissions. Carbon becomes increasingly difficult to capture the farther it gets away from its source point. And the methods to do this are very expensive and would need to be widely implemented in a short amount of time to be effective. So what do we do? Well, a company called CarbFix is hopefully coming up with a solution for this called carbon mineralization. It's where they dissolve carbon in water and then inject it into basaltic rocks or other reactive rocks to permanently solidify and mineralize it and reduce it from re-entering the atmosphere. They start their trials in 2022 to hopefully offer companies a more effective and cost-efficient way to reduce carbon emissions. Even with all this science, the most effective way to stop uh, these false informations is to be aware, raise awareness, put out accurate information, because climate change doesn't get nearly enough attention for how big of a problem it is. Our biggest tool is to raise awareness and to advocate to do the right thing, because without, without even acknowledging the science, the biggest issue is that we're not acknowledging how big of a problem this is. And if we don't do that, there's no hope for saving our planet. I leave you with this, be aware, be vigilant and do whatever you can today so that we have the possibility for a tomorrow. Thank you.